Welcome to another edition of the Dementia Care Partner Talk Show. Now, here's dementia care expert Tifa Snow and your host, Greg Phelps. Active for Life provides one-of-a-kind seated dance and fitness programs and products for those living with dementia and their care partners in both group settings or at home. Whether it's AFL's proprietary seated tap class, Tap Time, or seated ballroom class, Seated Rhythm, Active for Life's programs are designed to exercise both brain and body while spreading positivity and joy. For more information, go to activitiesforlifefitness.com. Feeding our seniors. Now, just a second there, before we get into the topic, um, I've heard the term feeders. Um, what is that? Oh, this is me whining. Really? Seriously? We can't, you know, like, oh my. So to me, feeding a child, I mean, takes the responsibility because the child doesn't have the, I'm holding the bottle because the baby can't figure out how to hold the bottle. I mean, they're great at sucking and swallowing. They got that down to a fine art. They don't even have necks, so they don't have to worry about choking. They can lay on their backs and suck it down. But I am holding the bottle. Um, little kids, I often have to give them bites because they have not mastered the use of their hands and their arms to get stuff from their tabletop to their mouths. Um, and then they start to master that skill. And from then on, frankly, um, I may prepare the food, I may serve the food, I may cut up the food, I may get it all so that it's there, and I may have to help you get to the table. But we get to a certain point at somewhere around age two, two, about two, when most folks start to take over that responsibility for eating. And so I feed myself, thank you very much. So this idea that somebody's going to feed me, it's like the only place that, you know, I tend to think about that as a, well, it's not particularly healthy. It's when you go to the, you know, the bar and we're going to get fed. We're going to go to the this restaurant and get our, get fed. I mean, is that what we say? I'm, we're going out to eat and I'm going to get fed. Well, I, I've, heard, I've heard the term um, uh, feeder table. Now, Ooh. did did they actually have those? I mean, what yeah. is this? Yeah, back in the day, they created horseshoe tables where a carer would sit in the center, and they would have up to four people placed around the outside of the horseshoe, and they would go bite, 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 and we'd poke food at people, and everybody really was thrilled because this was super efficient and institutional and awful and and people did not even understand what was going on but we would we would park people in front of this theater table and you know that's where we would put people and often people who had capacity lost capacity because of this this thing and they also lost weight um they also uh, got dehydrated because it's hard to do this well from across a table I mean, if you if you doubt it, you know, sit on one side of a narrow table and poke things at another human being and see how that works for you. Just say, like, who wants to do this the rest of your life? So why would we do this? Because I, I think what happens sometimes is, you know, the care, care facilities are often chronically understaffed. And, you know, that seems to answer a, a question, you know, like, how can I get all yeah. these people? How can I get these people done? And yeah. so if I put the food down in front of mom or somebody else and she's not looking at it, well, you know, unless I help her, she's not going to eat. Mm -hmm. Am I missing something in there? Like, mm -hmm. am I, is there this big canyon that I didn't look down in? <laughs> yeah, there's this great big canyon called visual cues, audio cues, and then touch cues that could actually get somebody going. And the idea that depending on how busy the environment is, there should be there, there are so many distractions that the person can't stay focused on what we're doing because there's so many other things happening, or there's so many things on the plate, or there's so many pieces of things that you can manipulate. So I'm mess, I've got the fork, the knife, the spoon, I've got two glasses and a mug. I've got the plate and I've got a, a salad bowl and I've got the soup bowl and I've got the this and I've got mean. There are so many opportunities that what we have is we've created a disaster area on the tabletop. And we're asking somebody with limited abilities to figure it all out. And then we say, here's your lunch. And then we walk away and they watch us walk away. And we don't recognize, well, if I want you focused on the lunch, I should have like made sure. So, hey, Greg. Here you go. And I'm pointing to the item and I say, here, try to see what you think of it. And then I pick the spoon up and, 
and position it so you could take it. And I say, right there, try that. And then if you start eating and you don't look up and say, that was great, don't say anything, move away. Because what happened is you're engaged and you are helping yourself eat, you're feeding yourself. And if I say something, I'll stop you doing that. So I think um, sometimes, I wonder how much might come from the, you know, like when we give meds, when nurses give meds or aides give meds, um, there's this, if I don't control where the med goes in you, you may not get it in where it belongs and then there's a problem. And I'm wondering if the same feeling exists for food. If I don't get this in that you, there'll be a problem. So the easiest thing to do is let me take over and do this. And rather than, why would you not want to stay engaged in this process? Because to me, that's that opportunity for you to say, yes, no, another bite, not another bite. I'd rather have a bite of this. I don't want that. Um, we've eliminated a lot of ways to communicate other than refusal. Um, and we've also really assumed that the sensory experience of having someone put stuff in your mouth um, and you chew it up and swallow it, or you take it in and you swallow it, it's it's a really intimate experience. And I think if we stay so far away from the person, we can lose touch with what's actually going on. And there's a risk there that the person could aspirate, the person could get too much in their mouth. Um, the person could go too quickly and not be able to overcome what I've just put in there. That's a third bite I've put in, they haven't swallowed. Um, their mouth is getting dry. They, they don't like the flavor and they're holding it in their mouth. Um, there's so many options. So many maybe, options. maybe you could explain a bit about how the visual changes might uh, affect somebody's ability to to eat, because mm -hmm. I, I remember something about uh, about that, but I can't remember all the details. It, it's not complicated, but you just have to be aware mm -hmm. of this. Yeah. So the reality is, by the time we're at a place where we're thinking about helping someone eat, then what's going on with the vision is I have about an 18 inch across circle in front of me. So if you put your hands out and you were to create like 18 inches across there at arm's length and make a circle, that's how much of the world I can take in. So if you take your hands and make two O's out of them and put them up to your eyes, sort of like you're wearing binoculars and you, you check that out, that's pretty much what you've got. So if I'm looking up and out, I can't actually see what's down on my plate. If I look at my plate, I can't see out. But also when you move something toward my face, somewhere at about 12 inches, I'll lose it. I will not be able to observe it. So if you put on binoculars and look down at yourself, you won't even be able to see your own shirt very well. What that means is the spoon moving toward my mouth with somebody else in control of it. I don't even know when it's gonna get there until it, it hits my mouth. And for many people, that's actually a startle reflex. And a startle doesn't encourage you to eat, it actually discourages. Um, but what I could also do is have somebody, and I'm saying, open, open, open. And it's like, oh my heavens, what a hard way to spend a meal. We don't even do that to our kids. Well, I guess we do, but we sing. Yeah, yeah, we do. Or we go, airplane, coming in. And we move it around and we move it around and we say, here it comes. And it becomes a game that kids get bored with. I say, I'll do it. I do it. <laughs> I got the Cheerios. I'll smear them all over my face and get them in rather than you do it. <laughs> Tipa, we know that nourishment is essential to life. And so obviously this is a topic that people yeah. could, should, would pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Do you have videos on this or is there a course on this or or how do I get uh, myself up to yeah. speed? We have videos on it. We, ha we have courses that relate to it. Uh, we do a lot of what we call supported eating. Um, so we offer a lot of different levels of assistance at eating from, you know, just basically making sure everything's there, limiting what's out there, um, to actually full assist. But full assist is never done without the human being being involved. So we believe strongly you can modify hand under hand, you can do a lot of things, but you should never be doing to someone. So we have a lot of tools out there and a lot of folks who are really skillful at helping you figure out where is your person? Where are we? What's going on? What can we try? How can we test it out? How can we check back in? Because I think when you're going from a situation where somebody's been fed, we can still recover. It's interesting how many people, you know, have said over the years when you do it, they go, oh, I feel like I'm 
I feel like I'm being listened to. <laughs> it's like, oh, cool. I feel like so I'm doing it myself. Is this something I have to learn in person or is this something that I can learn online? Do you offer Zoom or is there somebody I can talk to individually about this? Yeah, we do consults for individuals. We do champion courses, which champion two is a is a big one that we actually work with people on that hand skill, that skill of visual verbal touch cueing. Um, and we also have one on one opportunities of consulting with our mentors because our mentors are skilled at this stuff and they can help you become skilled. Tipa, thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. The Dementia Care Partners podcast is brought to you by Active for Life. For more information on today's podcast, visit tipasnow.com. If you're signed into your Spotify account, we'd love to get your feedback. How? Click into the episode details and look over the episode question and poll. Send us your comments and vote so we can answer your questions and better tailor this content to your needs. We look forward to hearing from you. Hi, I'm Tifa Snow, and you just found our YouTube channel and watched one of our videos. I'm the owner and founder of Positive Approach to Care. Thanks for watching. And if you liked, if you have a comment about, or you would, please share it with people you know. Oh, and if you haven't yet done it, consider subscribing. We'll let you know when the next new video comes out. And you might want to visit our website, www tipasnow.com, where you'll find other resources as well. See you there.